morning? Still morning? Good morning. There we go. Um, wonderful to be here. My name is Arielle Stern. I am an assistant professor in the Technology and Operations Management Unit here at HBS. My research is about 21st century healthcare products and also 21st century healthcare delivery. Um, and I'm delighted to be here today to talk about biomarkers, analytics, and the data-driven future of precision medicine. We could talk about these topics for years, so what we're going to do today is take a very brief dive into one of the applications. Um, all right, precision medicine, very exciting stuff. We hear a lot these days about personalized and precision medicine, and it's incredibly exciting and compelling to think that targeted therapeutics um, could exist for individual patients in a, in a completely or largely data-driven way. Um, I've written about this a lot, and particularly I'm interested in the innovation incentives component of this and how this changes our incentives for doing R&D in biomedical research. So how do we get there? Biomarkers, okay, that was in the title. All right, so what do we mean when we talk about biomarkers? I know there are some life sciences folks here, but I know there are also some non-life sciences folks here. So the FDA has this very concise and easy to read definition. So it's a defined characteristic that is measured as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes, or responses to an exposure or intervention, including therapeutic interventions, Molecular, histologic, radiographic, or, psych or physiologic characteristics are types of biomarkers. Blah. All right, this is my definition. Biomarkers are just things you can physically measure about a patient. So in the context of something like cancer, we think about things that you can measure that might be associated with cancer risk or cancer outcomes. So for example, in a world where we have a lot of sequencing technology, there are very specific genetic mutations that we know to be associated with higher risks of cancer. So those genetic mutations would be a biomarker for that cancer once they're established scientifically. But we also have very simple biomarkers. So age is a biomarker. If you're older, you have a higher risk of cancer. And it's something we can also just measure about people that tells us something about disease or disease risk. Um, and these days, we are just getting really good at measuring new stuff. That's very exciting, okay? So this is a data talk. Um, so what does that mean? Where does that leave us with respect to developing new therapies? Well, already today, clinical research and drug development look meaningfully different than they used to, and that's because of the big data we already have, the sequencing technologies that already exist. Um, however, and this is where my research really focuses, we have inherited from the 20th century a set of R&D norms, and I'll, I'll put this in quotes, best practices, um, as well as a set of regulatory approval processes, all of which were designed with older technologies in mind um, and older therapies in mind. And so what I want to ask is, are there better and are there data-driven ways to develop precision medicines? And so I'm going to just dive into one potential approach in our remaining couple of minutes to talk about adaptive platform trials. It has a lot of exciting words in it, and we're going to unpack those. So historically, very simple randomized control trials have been the gold standard of biomedical research. So why is that? Well, they're very straightforward and very easy to understand. And we get very good causal inference for one question with a randomized control trial. So this is just an example. Um, let's imagine we are going to run a randomized control trial for an experimental new therapeutic for glioblastoma, which is a rare and relatively deadly form of brain cancer. And we have, some, we have some very smart biostatisticians. They're going to help us do our power calculations. Everyone remember your, your uh, college stats class. And we determine, based on these power calculations, that what we're going to need is 40 patients to receive the experimental therapy for glioblastoma. So this is a new drug. And 40 patients who will be in our control group. And in the case of cancer trials, they don't get nothing. They actually get the standard of care. In this case, it's, it's radiation and a drug called temozolomide. All right. Now let's say we have two experimental therapies for glioblastoma. So we're going to run that experiment that we ran before. We've got, you know, in this case, our 80 patients, 40 get the experimental therapy, 40 are in the control group. We're going to look at outcomes at the end of the experiment. And if we have another therapy that may be good for patients with glioblastoma, we're going to do that same thing in a totally siloed off way. This is how clinical research happens today. This isn't just, this isn't an exaggeration. This is actually how we develop drugs. All right, so the total for these two studies is 160 patients. Why do we want to do things differently? Well, with two experimental therapies and two randomized controlled trials, it looks like this. 
with only 50% of patients, by the way, receiving experimental therapies. But what if we have a platform? What if we have a platform for doing clinical research? Now we can have two exp experimental therapies on one platform. We share a control arm. And in this world, the, two, the total for answering these exact same two questions, the total number of patients we need is 120 rather than 160. This is a lot of money in a world where we're talking about cancer trials that cost about $50,000 per patient to run. So we just saved $2 million by doing this. All right, fewer patients are needed, the same number of patients, however, are getting experimental therapies in this world, so that's really important. And now for the patients, their chance, if they enroll in this trial platform of getting an experimental new therapy, is two-thirds instead of 50%. This sounds way better. All right, but now where do, where do these biomarkers come in? Now we can add arms. So now we can ask biomarker-driven questions. So we have these biomarker-defined subsets of the population. So in glioblastoma, there's a methylated and unmethylated form of glioblastoma. So what if we say, okay, for experimental therapy number two, folks in the yellow arm of the trial are, have the methylated form of glioblastoma. In the blue arm of the trial, they have the unmethylated form of glioblastoma. We can actually now ask three different questions on this platform and get a biomarker-driven answer to our question about this experimental therapy. Again, there are all sorts of efficiencies. So now 75% of patients are receiving experimental therapy. Patients really like this. And we can grow the platform. We can add different experimental arms. Now we can maybe do a biomarker-driven uh, question with respect to experimental therapy number one. Now we've got an even higher share of patients receiving experimental therapies. And on this platform, with just 200 patients, we're now asking four questions. And we're able to answer four questions. All right, what does an adaptive platform trial do? That was just a platform. Now we can actually add some data and analytics to all of this, because we're good at that these days. Now we can incorporate Bayesian adaptive randomization. This is basically for the folks who come from an online um, advertising and marketing and research space. This is going to look very familiar. Um, and what we can do is we can use adaptive randomization we run simulations to, to, to be basically just use data as it accumulates. We're collecting all this data, and as data accumulate about how patients of a certain type respond to a certain therapy, we can preferentially assign patients to the arms of the trial they're most likely to benefit from. And we can do this in an extraordinarily statistically rigorous way that still allows us to do causal inference. And so now we can learn that the patients getting experimental therapy number two with the methylated form of glioblastoma benefit a lot the patients with the unmethylated form don't. And we can use that to drive drug discovery in a precision medicine world. OK, so what's so hard about implementing this? Well, this is comp comp computationally sophisticated. Um, and on top of that, pharma and clinical researchers aren't used to doing studies this way. And this goes all the way to the top. This is medical journals. This is funding. Everything about the research endeavor is set up to answer individual questions, not to do research on platforms. Um, upfront coordination is necessary, and this changes the cost structure. This requires basically higher upfront costs with lower running costs for doing research. Um, and then, of course, we need new organizational and financing mechanisms to do this type of clinical research. Um, that results in a lot of open questions. So how do you actually finance a research platform like this? Um, how do we learn from data? And more importantly, in addition to doing data-driven um, research about biomarkers we already know about, how can we use these platforms as information accumulates to develop new biomarkers to help us understand some of these precision medicine questions? So I look forward to discussing. Thank you, everyone.